what the heck is Ant X? And by the way, what's Ant X T and TV and TVT? We're going to talk about that here today. Uh, when we gather data, the, up in the corner, we see it comes in as a bunch of raw samples, and those get split into antenna samples and reference samples. The antenna samples come over here, and with some processing and math, they turn into ant B having to do with baseline, ant B samples. If we take the ant and the ref and use them together, we come up with two signals, ant R A, the first one, which is an intermediate calculation, and then ant R B. The second letter, ant R B, R for reference. One, two, three, four, five different signals. Four of them actually have columns in the output file, the .ezb file. And you can choose any one of them uh, to continue on with processing. The one you choose is 0 through 6, as shown here which correspond to their column numbers mostly. And that's a number you put in with a command line keyword value of easy con ant x input. Until you choose one, I don't know which one it is. It's a little mysterious. And so I've called it ant x. It's some kind of signal coming from the antenna mostly. But I don't know what which signal it is. Ant X is the generic name. It moves on to other processes in the software where it gets trimmed. That adds a T to the end of it, Ant X T. Or it gets adjusted for velocity with the value of VLSR. We're about to talk about that. And you can turn it on and off uh, with this keyword up here, easy con use VLSR, a zero or a one. And then after that, you could trim it again, meaning take off the high frequencies and the low frequencies, as determined by this long commit keyword, easy con ant x TVT. Frequency bins, fraction, and it's a list because it's a set of two numbers. And that adds another T for trim on the end. So ant x TVT is the output that goes into column 18 in the output file. So ant x T is simply a form of post processing after the original signals are created. We start with ant x, that's the mysterious one, it becomes the ant x t, ant x t v for velocity, ant x t v t with another trim on the end. But if I actually know what's inside it, which one I've chosen, I may just use ant b and then put a t on it and or a t v or a t v t. So I may speak precisely about what signal that actually is. Ant r b t v t is the extreme down here. Ant RB, we can trim off the low frequencies down here that aren't particularly necessary. And up here to see the important stuff in the middle where all the hydrogen information is. And come up with Ant RBT for trim. The next one's a little more complicated. VLSR. Uh, you may be aware that the sun is living out there in space someplace. It has a bunch of stars around it, a neighborhood of stars. And all of those are rotating around the galaxy. And the sun, of course, is traveling in its neighborhood of stars. It's not st stationary. It is actually moving with respect to the average velocity 
of its neighborhood stars. Around the sun is the earth revolving about. So it has a motion as it revolves. And then the earth itself is rotating around its north-south axis. And for every position on earth, except the north and south poles, there's a motion having to do with that as well. So we have three motions to deal with here, shown in purple. Let's go back to the sun here. I say the sun is moving about uh, in one direction through its neighborhood of stars. It turns out by graph, we know the sun is moving towards what's called the solar apex. And because we live in a sphere of a universe, it must be moving away from something called the solar antipex. This is in right ascension declination coordinates. If we look in galactic coordinates, sure enough, it's moving towards the solar apex and away from the solar antipex. So when we look with our telescopes, we can see galactic hydrogen out in space. And it should be, it started to transmit at a certain frequency. But because of its movement and the Doppler effect, that frequency may appear different once we receive it. We can use that information to understand how the galactic hydrogen is moving with respect to our telescope. If we're looking out at the hydrogen off in the distance, we need to compensate for these motions. Again, the telescope is moving with respect to the galactic hydrogen, but we use the approach that the telescope is moving relative to a middle ground, a local standard of rest, LSR. And then we can study how that LSR is moving with respect to the galactic hydrogen. That local standard of rest is the average velocity of the stars in the sun's neighborhood. We know three motions to get to from the telescope to the local standard of rest, and we can calculate those having to do with time and where you are on the Earth and in which way the telescope is pointing. And so we can subtract or accommodate for the telescope motion with respect to the local standard of reference. In the middle is the velocity of the local standard of reference, VLSR. And I'm emphasizing that receding away from us is a positive velocity of the local standard of rest. So we're studying how the local standard of rest is moving with respect to the telescope. We can calculate that. And then we could subtract it to study the other part. What would be the maximum speed of this VLSR? We have three different motions. And we know the sun's motion relative to the local standard of rest is about 20 kilometers per second towards the solar apex. Okay, now we got one number. Another number is the Earth's motion revolving around the sun once a year. We know what the circumference is divided by how many days and how many hours and how many minutes and how many seconds to get 29.86 kilometers per second. And number three is the motion of the telescope location on the Earth, which rotates once a day. We know the circumference of the equator of the Earth divided by 24 hours, divided by 60 minutes, divided by 60 seconds, gives us 0 0.46 kilometers per second. 
compared to the other two numbers of 20 and tw almost 30, uh, half a kilometer per second is a pretty small number. So in many cases, EasyCon simply ignores motion number three. So we have three motions. And if all three motions happen to align to move towards the solar apex, then the maximum speed would simply be the sum of those three numbers, about 50 and a half kilometers per second. But remember, approaching direction is defined as negative. So the VLSR would be minus 50.32 because the telescope is moving toward the solar apex. Maybe said in a better way, the local standard of reference in the direction of the solar apex would appear to be approaching the telescope. So the solar apex has a negative VLSR, meaning a negative receding velocity of the local standard of rest. Six months later, the Earth and the telescope are moving away from the solar apex. And so its VLSR would be a different sum, some positives and some negatives, in this case, 10.32. So depending on the, where the telescope is pointing in the sky, each sample's calculated VLSR value could be positive or negative. And indeed, it changes dramatically throughout one day. Sometimes the telescope is on the front of the Earth as it orbits around the sun. But 12 hours later, it will be on the back of the Earth facing the other way. And the local standard of reference may be retreating from it. It's much like looking out the front windshield of a moving car or turning around and looking out the back window of a car. Sometimes things are coming towards you and sometimes things are going away from you. This is what explains the curvy nature of the hydrogen snake in our samples. So having calculated the VLSR value for each one of these vertical line samples, we can apply it by moving that spectrum up or down appropriately to the VLSR value. And that flattens out the curvy snake into a flat line near the center of the Doppler spectrum. To achieve the V of ant R, B, T for trim, V for velocity signal. But a look at all this wavy stuff going on at the top and the bottom. Let's trim that off and avoid the confusion. After that post-processing, we get ant RB TVT with another T for trim on here. And that makes a cleaner signal. This last signal, ant RB TVT, gets recorded in the output data file, the .ezb data file. Now we move on to creating the other data file having to do with the galaxy spectra. We're gonna talk about where the samples are near the galactic plane. We know that the galactic latitude varies even within one day. Sometimes we're looking above the galactic plane with a positive value, and sometimes we're looking below the galactic plane. But some samples are actually near the galactic plane, right there at zero. But uh, define what near is. EasyCon allows you to define that with a big long keyword, EasyCon Gal Crossing, galactic latitude of 3.0 would define near as plus or minus three galactic latitude degrees up and down. In that case, only those samples within plus or minus three degrees are selected and collected in the output file. They are sorted by one degree galactic longitudes. 
For each galactic longitude, each spectra becomes an average of the collected samples. If the last data file had a certain name, we use that certain name and add GAL for galaxy and dot NPZ, which can then be read by EasyGal. We'll talk about that in the next video.